wife and I moved to Memphis, Tennessee about two and a half years ago. And I began to pray a prayer that would wreck my life. I began to pray that God uh, would open up my eyes to see the world he saw, the way he saw the world, to love the world the way he loves it, that my heart would be broken by the things that would break the heart of God. So this prayer took me on a journey all over the city of Memphis where I saw some neighborhoods that are some of the most depressed neighborhoods you could find in America. And I also went through some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in our city where I saw people who were poor in another kind of way, that if they were to be spending the same amount of time uh, working on their marriage and then working on their relationship with their children as they were cleaning their Mercedes, things would look differently. My journey took me to a place called Hope House, which is a daycare for kids who suffer from the AIDS epidemic. And to be in Hope House, uh, you have to have a parent who is infected with AIDS, and you have to be under the poverty line. So Hope House is made up of a lot of kids under the age of five who either they have a parent who is dying from AIDS or 33% of the kids are dying from AIDS. And I walked into Hope House about a year and a half ago with another one of my minister friends, and we sat in the back of this room with about a dozen kids. All of them were about the age of two to three in this room. And they were singing songs along with this worship minister who was there. And they were just having fun with all of these songs. And I was just kind of overcome with emotions in the back, thinking how many of these kids, how their lives are just going to be changed because of this awful disease that is in them or in their parents. So I went and I went uh, and I sat down with the kids. And before I could even get to the ground, the kids were like climbing all over me, climbing on my shoulders, on my head, putting fingers in my ears and in my eyes, rolling their fingers around my ring. And this one kid just sat in my lap, and through about two or three songs, he would just stare into my eyes. So I leaned over during the song, and I said, hey, buddy, what's your name? He said, my name's Timmy. Timmy was about two, maybe two and a half. And I leaned in, and I said, Timmy, do you know what my name is? And he just stared at me, and I said, you can call me Mr. Josh. And Timmy said, he shook his head, and he said, no, I want to call you my daddy. And I was driving home that day, overcome with emotions. I mean, crying like I had just seen the notebook for like the eighth time. <laughs> and I got home and opened up the front door and just hugged my wife and said, baby, we got to go adopt a bunch of kids down at Hope House. <laughs> when I moved to Memphis, I was warned by so many people back in Texas. My wife and I are Texans, born and raised. And so how many Texans are here? Do we have a few? How many of you agree that Texans have egos? Do we have a few? <laughs> when my wife and I chose to move to Memphis, there were people who thought we were crazy. They were saying things like, have you ever been to Memphis? Did you know Memphis isn't in Texas? Uh, there were these people saying things like, have you thought about the kids? And we're like, yeah, like we're going to make decisions and not really think about our kids. And it's at this point that I did realize Texans had egos. My wife quickly got, got pregnant we, for our, with our second child after I moved to Memphis. And we had people who were sending us Texas soil to put on the floor of the delivery room so that even though we were having a baby in Memphis, Tennessee, we could still have a baby on Texas soil. I mean, people from Idaho and Kansas don't do these kind of things, right? And as I go to Hope House... And I'll be there again this Friday in this little buddy system where I have this two-year-old kid who I'm mentoring who can say the S word and the B word in every sentence. He's two years old, which will tell you something about his environment. And I look in this place with these kids, and I think something is wrong with this picture. And I'll never forget February 22nd when I got the phone call that the one thing that could not happen to my sister as she was battling from strep throat and septic shock in the hospital. February 22nd, I got the call that the one thing that couldn't happen, they said there was a one in a 500,000 chance that the septic shock would go to her brain, that one thing happened. And we got the call that they had called my family in to tell my 31-year-old sister who had been perfectly healthy three weeks before that we had to come in and tell her bye. And something isn't right with this picture. And the fact that today there are 30,000 kids who will die because of malnutrition and preventable diseases, something just doesn't seem right with that picture. Something doesn't seem right that there are so many people today who, because they don't have a car and they don't have a permanent address, they're not going to be able to find a job outside of a labor pool. And they're going to be paid so little money that they're going to continue to have to go back. Something just doesn't seem right with this picture. 
And I think it's Bishop John of Rwanda, the Bishop of Rwanda, who says it perfectly because someone came up to him one day and he said, someone asked him the question, what is the reason for the genocide? And he could have gone into a long answer. He could have talked about the tribal tension. He could have talked about the European influence, how Europeans came into Rwanda, and they came in with this idea of, hey, this place is unified, so we've got to stir up some rumors to set these people against each other. So they came in with the idea of divide and conquer. And Bishop John could have given all of these answers, but he gave a one-word answer. When asked the question, what is the reason for this genocide, his answer was sin. It's sin. Sometimes we don't like to talk about sin, but maybe talking about sin is our only hope. Maybe talking about sin is the only hope for us. Maybe talking about sin is the only hope for the world because Scripture seems to be pretty clear that sin is not just about breaking the rules, but sin is about isolation and separation. And isolation and separation is not good for your relationship with God. It's not good for your relationship with other people. It's not good for the good of the world. So you're in this study in the book of Genesis, which in Genesis chapter 1 and in chapter 2, or chapter 1 and chapter 2, you have this creation story where God sets in motion this wonderful thing that people are made in his very own image. And then we come to Genesis chapter 3 where you have this story of Adam and Eve and this talking snake. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm at the Memphis Zoo with my family and a snake starts talking to me, I'm not going to stick around for that conversation. I'm going straight to my doctor. I'm going straight to some kind of pills to take away whatever just happened. All right, but we have this story of Adam and Eve eating some fruit. And the moment they eat the fruit, their eyes are opened, and they can see that they're naked, they're nude. So they're reaching for things to cover them up, and they're trying to cover up not because they are cold and they need something to keep them warm. They are covering up because there is shame. They're trying to cover up the shame because sin leads to isolation and separation and shame. And in this moment, we realize that humanity has been seduced. It's a story of seduction where you have the enemy who comes into our lives to seduce us and to try and tempt us that... Did God really say the things he said? Were the commands that God gave, are they really good for you? Maybe you've heard this story before of the woman who had this addiction to shopping. I guess you've heard that story a lot, right? But there's this woman who was addicted to shopping, and she would come home with clothes, and her husband would say, baby, we've got to put some disciplines and some boundaries in place. You're spending way too much money on clothes, and she continued to buy more and more clothes. So finally, they came up with this plan that the next time she went to the mall and she was tempted to buy something, she would say, get behind me, Satan. So they practiced this. She would put her hand up and say, get behind me, Satan. And the husband went to work. He came home, and the woman had more clothes at the house. She had bought more clothes. And he said, baby, what happened? I thought we had a good plan. You were supposed to say, get behind me, Satan. And she said, look, I saw a dress that I liked. I tried it on. I said, get behind me, Satan. Then all I could hear him say was, it looks really good from back here, too. So she bought the dress. All right, it's this story of seduction. We've been seduced. So what you have at the very beginning of Scripture, in Genesis 1 and 2, God creates, and he creates out of chaos. He creates out of darkness. And here's the really good news for you and me, is that this is the same story that happens today. We have a God that can create something out of your darkness and your pain and your struggles and your chaos. He can do it all over again. So the creation story isn't just about something that happened. It is about something that is still happening in your life. That's really good news, right? And the same is true with Genesis 3, that this is not just a story about Adam and Eve who made a poor decision, and then there was the fall of humanity. This isn't just something that happened back then. It is something that still happens every day in our lives, where we are seduced by things that we think are pleasing to the eye, and it still happens. So what do we do with this? I have a guy who called me up about six months ago. He said, hey, can I just come sit in your office? I need to confess some sins. He's a guy who's been going through Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the 12 steps is to confess your sins to someone else. So he said, can I just come to your office and confess sins? It's not because I see you as some priest and I'm going to go through you to get forgiveness. But I just need someone I can sit down with and I feel like you're a safe place. I said, sure, come on in. 
And he came into my office, and he started to confess his sins. He went all the way back to as a small kid. By the age of 13, he was in a juvenile prison. And within the first two minutes of our conversation, he said, and I killed my first person at the age of 14. All right, at this point, I'm thinking, man, what happened to people coming in, like confessing that they cheated on taxes or something like that, you know? Here's this person in the first One of the first things he confesses is that he killed his first person at the age of 14. Now, if he said, I killed my first person at the age of 14, that means there's more coming, right? So I'm thinking as I'm sitting there in my office, I mean, what do I have in here to defend myself? I mean, other than a few pens and memories of how Jason Bourne would take down people, I mean, that's pretty much all I got. And he went on and on describing some of the horrible things that he had done in his life. And he continued to say that the first 30 years of my life were complete hell. He just found Jesus a couple of years ago. So I stopped him in mid-sentence and I said, listen, there is no way that I can argue uh, that the first 30 years of your life weren't complete hell. But do you believe that God has the power to rewrite your story? Do you believe that the power of the resurrection is here? to rewrite this story for you so that God can do something with the next 30 years of your life that can be so redemptive and glorious and beautiful. Do you believe that? And as you and I find ourselves in this rhythm and in this motion of the whole Genesis 1 through 3 story of being created in the image of God and then being stripped of humanity and being seduced by the enemy, do we believe that God has the power to rewrite your story, to rewrite your script right now? Eugene Peterson, in one of his books, he talks about how as a kid, he would go hang out with this friend who was working out on this land. And his friend had one job, and it was to ride fence. That's what they would call it, riding fence, because they owned so much land that this guy would just ride around this fence, and he would look for any broken places in the fence, any weaknesses, because cattle are always looking for those places where they can get through a fence into some territory that is not their territory. So he would ride fence, fixing all of the broken places and all of the weak places that were there. And maybe that's what we need today. Maybe that's what you need. You need someone to ride fence in your life. Maybe what we need this morning is for God to ride fence. To ride fence around our hearts, looking for those weaknesses in those broken places, in those places where we are susceptible to seduction, so that God can come through and with the power of the resurrection, that he can fix it. There are some people who act like their Bibles begin in Genesis chapter 3, that it begins with the fall of humanity. But the good news of the Bible is it begins in Genesis 1 and 2 with this creation story of being made in the image of God. That is what God wants for you. Let's pray together. God, today I'm asking for the power of the resurrection of Jesus to come and to reclaim your image upon our lives. And whatever weaknesses, wherever there is brokenness and pain and the fences around our hearts, I'm asking for you today to come and with your power and with your presence for you to fix it. God, and as we look around all around us and we see the consequences of the fall of humanity, God, will you give us hearts that will beat with yours, that we may truly believe that the resurrection of Jesus is the best news for the world. God, give us dreams, give us visions of of the whole new world that you have set in motion, a world of redemption, a world that gets us back to the very beginning where we are living and acting and moving as if we truly are made in your image. God, I pray over this campus as as some of these kids are getting close uh, to graduating, some of them are just now starting, but that you will use this place Uh, as a campus that will form and shape them into the image of Jesus and to launch them into this world to be your people. God, this is my prayer in your name. Amen.